Uh, I'm <clears throat> proud to be here on behalf of the Coal Lakes Research Farm. It's something we take quite a bit of pride in. This is our main station right there. We have both dry land and irrigated facilities. If you're not familiar with us, it was uh, started by, of course, a group of farmers. This is what it looks like from uh, our property. We have, we're a typical middle of South Dakota thing where we only have trees in the major, major drainage ways. And Ruth and I are going to go to Australia here in a few, few weeks. And I showed this very slide in Australia the first time I went there. And somebody in the audience said, where did the trees go? Because they have low rainfall areas, but they, get, they have lots of trees because the rainfall comes in the cool part of the year. And I just flippantly said, well, Paul Bunyan cut them down. <laughs> they had no idea who Paul Bunyan was. Okay, so you got to be a little careful when you do these things. Uh, <clears throat> the movie The Revenant was actually a true story that happened in western South Dakota. If you went to the movie, there's all these trees. There's no damn trees at Lemon. And that's where the guy got mauled is at Lemon, and he crawled to just north of Pier and took a boat down the river to Chamberlain. There wasn't, there's no trees in there. And <clears throat> but they had to film it where there's trees. So you have to be a little careful with your audience. Uh, yet last night, and some of you weren't there, but last night Keith Burns talked about leaders. These are three leaders. Uh, I don't consider myself one of them. On, on your left is Colin Sice. He's a guy from Australia that does the grain and graze or pasture cropping system. And then next to him, and looking very cold in my coat, is Rolf Derps. And I think Keith Burns talked about Rolf some today. And the guy on your right, far right, is, is a guy we call, I call Duracell, but his name is Dursu uh, Gassan. He's from Brazil. And probably one of the first guys that talked about some of these natural uh, insecticide type insect control things. Dursu, unfortunately, left us this year, but they all showed up on a day similar to day, today, um, several years ago at the farm, because they wanted to visit. And, and Dursu really got into it. He, he's like Duracell. He's always going. Everybody else kind of wanted to stay in the truck. But we get, we get down to the river, and there's ice. Dursu had never seen ice. And he went running out on the water, and he says, I'm like, Jesus, I can walk on water. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> a couple of years ago, five years ago, in fact, and, and my wife Ruth, none of what I have done uh, would have been possible without Ruth helping along the way. She's, and she kind of has really taken the no-till association and kept them going through a lot of years, and they've done a wonderful amount of work in the past. A few years ago, we took a trip to France. It was actually right after the Charlie Hebdo uh, thing, but <clears throat> we weren't close to Paris, and we, we, we got a GPS-speaking uh, uh, English-speaking GPS system on a car, and we tra travel from town to town doing no-till meetings. And we do the meeting from 8 till noon, of course, through a translator, and then we'd, we'd leave at lunchtime because it takes about two and a half hours to eat lunch in France, which is not a bad thing. It just doesn't mean you can't get to the next spot very easily. So we take off before lunch and travel to the next town and see the tourist spots on the way, and somebody would meet us there and fill us in, have dinner, and then the, the next day we'd, we'd do it again. But they all had to show us their castles. And <clears throat> we'd go and see the castles, and they had their grain bins, and they looked really nice, and every town had a castle. And you say, where did you produce the grain that went into the grain bins? Well, around the castle. Well, the only thing they could produce around the castle now is a few shrubs. And if you look at the land that they had there, that is their good land. And they do an incredible amount of tillage. They till up and down the hill. Sometimes they go to places where they can't actually go up the hill and they can't go across the hill because they tip over, so they drive up and then plow down. And so <clears throat> not long after we went there, I started telling them that my ancestors left Europe because they had degraded the soil so badly that they weren't productive anymore and they had to go find some new soils and then they promptly started to degrade the soils where they went to. And we've done a really good job of it. Okay? 
So it's not one of these things that we just lately have realized, or we realized in the 2000s. It's something that's been going on forever. South Dakota was quote unquote discovered. Uh, <laughs> the Native Americans have, have real reason to, to not like that term, but the Lave Andre brothers came from, from Winnipeg and went across the Continental Divide in North Dakota, there is one there, it's about five feet high, sometime, uh, someplace between Jamestown and Bismarck, or Jamestown and Valley City, there's a continental divide. And they, they got into the Missouri River system and they were claiming that area for France, it was 1743, and they buried a, a, a lead plate above Fort Pier, claiming this area for France, and that's why we bought the Louisiana Purchase from France and not from somebody else. And before we did that, in the uh, late 1700s, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and all the leaders were talking back and forth to each other that if they continued to degrade the soils on the eastern seaboard as badly as they were, they were going to have to move west further. And, and George Washington said, well, maybe we should try to do a better job of taking care of our soils than we've been doing. I mean, really? Maybe we should start now. It's been 300 years, and we're still talking about it. Okay, and for the, re the reason that they had to move west, they kept degrading the soil, so they bought the Louisiana Purchase in 1803 and came through Pier, South Dakota, right across our property. They walked, Lewis Rock right across our, our property in, in, in 1804, because I went back to the journal. And what were they doing? They were coming out there looking for land to degrade, and they were also looking for beavers, a la the rev revenant. That's what they were doing. They came and killed the beavers. Sometimes look at the records of how many hundreds of thousands of beavers they took out of the Missouri River system. And prior to those being gone, those beavers were building dams that kept the water from flooding the Missouri River. All the little draws and, and, and tributaries had beaver dams on them, so when you got big rainfalls, you didn't have lots of water and you also had trees in those draws. The only place that we have trees. Uh, <clears throat> so once we took the beavers out and then we brought in the settlers and they started to overgraze and season long graze and do tillage, we had floods. So what's a white European male response to that? Not to put the beaver back. Let's put in big dams. So we have four dams in South Dakota, one in Montana, one in North Dakota. One of the really interesting things about the Lewis and Clark's journey is early on in our talk about diversity and no-till, I was doing a meeting in North Dakota and I suggested they really needed to do corn in their rotations in North Dakota, to no-till and do corn. And one of the ARS scientists jumped up right in the middle of this meeting and said, we can't grow corn in North Dakota. And my response was that Lewis and Clark stopped at Bismarck and bought corn from the Native Americans for their journey. And that maybe the USDA research should try to get as advanced as the Native Americans were in 1804. <clears throat> uh, he did talk to me again here about five years ago. After. <laughs> so we put in big dams instead of doing what we should be doing. And then farmers, they were going to take water from eastern South Dakota to central South Dakota in the Redfield area to irrigate. And Daryl DeBoer, who's sitting here, was involved in some of that research on at Redfield, and also some of the stuff that subsequently followed when farmers along the Missouri River decided they wanted to take that water out of the reservoir and use center pivots to put it on. The reason they're going to take the water to Redfield is somebody had not invented a center pivot at the time they designed it, so they were going to put it on the Lacustrian Lake Dakota Plain. They didn't think that you could grow corn at Redfield <coughs> without irrigation. You didn't think you could grow soybeans at Redfield without irrigation. 
When I went there to run the farm at Redfield in 1983, there was 1,900 acres of soybeans in Spink and Brown County combined. And I almost didn't pass my orals on my PhD because I made the statement, uh, not real bright, that I thought we could probably do fine without the irrigation in Redfield if we just no-till. And they didn't think that that could possibly be true and I hadn't thought it through very well. But what happened out at <coughs> Cronin's place, and this is actually Ralph Holdsworth's pivot there, high pressure system put on inch of water in, in about 20 minutes or 25 minutes, and it would run off like this. That's a, that's a Cronin pivot. Well, that's not acceptable. And so we were looking at ways along with Daryl DeBoer, we had a project and we are looking at ways of making water go in the ground better under center pivots, especially if we switch from high pressure to low pressure, we put the water on faster. And a group of farmers got together and formed the Dakota Lakes Research Farm. And they own that place, and they work with SCSU to run it. And I think it's the only one that I know of that really runs that way. And Southeast Farm kind of is getting there. But el elsewhere in the world, it's the government owns the research farms. And therefore, be, it's driven by the government and not necessarily by the grassroots. And I think, I think we've been very successful. Very difficult thing to do, but I think we've been successful. If we, in 2014, we met with the Board of Regents and, and they were kind of wondering what we did and we came up with this thing here, the comparison of corn, soybean, spring wheat, winter wheat, whatever, uh, in north, uh, the north region, north central, central and south central, South Dakota, that area from probably 281 out to Missouri River or Highway 83, uh, roughly, has increased by $1.6 billion an acre between 1987 and, and 2014. They just produced that much more crop because they, were more, they made more efficient use of the water. They better use the resource. We didn't achieve this success because we set out and said we're going to make things better because we've been doing that, been trying to make the wheat varieties better, but guys are doing wheat and summer fallow in part of those areas. So they're doing spring wheat and barley at Redfield. We didn't set out to do that. We just said, hey, we're not doing a good job of getting the water in the ground. We're not doing a good job of keeping the water and whatever. So let's see what we can get done. And, and what we found out with Daryl DeBoer and I is if we did no-till, we made the water go in the ground better. Surprised everybody, okay? Uh, <clears throat> this approach is sometimes called a transformational or systems approach um, or holistic. There's lots of terms. It's kind of like uh, everybody comes up with new terms. I like this analogy better. The light bulb was not the result of incre incrementally improving candles. And a lot of our ag research is incrementally we're going to make it a half a bushel better, half a bushel better, and instead of going back and looking at the prairie and say, how did the prairie work? Because the prairie worked pretty dang well before we got here and started screwing it up. Uh, <clears throat> most present systems that we call no-till are only incrementally different from tilled systems. People still take a big tractor, hook onto a big implement, <laughs> and drive up and down, right? It's not really transformationally different. Now, what we have done in central South Dakota, and people talk about that, is we've stopped the bleeding. We used to have the highway closed between Oneida and Pier when the wind came up. That actually happened in 1977 or something like that, was one of the days. Because two years ago, Governor Dugard came to visit in the fall, and I took the Oneida paper where they talk about the 30, 40, 50 years ago. That was the week they'd closed the highway. They had pictures of that in the Oneida paper, and we just said, if you want to know what we did, this doesn't happen anymore. But we have a lot of work to do yet. President Kennedy didn't say we're going to make rockets a little better and hope someday that we can develop a space program. He just said, no, we're going to put people on the moon and the end of the decade. I want us to make a commitment today that we're going to stop this damn erosion now. 
We're going to stop that. We're going to stop the water quality degradation now. Now we're going to try to do a little better. We need to stop it now. Okay? A farmer manages ecosystem and takes sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and makes them into products he can sell. Strive to become the best harvester of water and sunlight. Not necessarily the best corn grower. Ecosystem processes. I'd focus on the processes, not on the results. Water cycle. Are we, are we managing our water cycle the way it's supposed to be managed? If we do it the way Mother Nature did it, we don't have water quality issues. If we screw it up, we send a bunch of nutrients to the Gulf of Mexico or to our lakes or we cause saline seeps. Energy flow. How much energy do we capture? And Keith talked about that day. Mineral cycle, recycling the nutrients appropriately. And the community dynamics, do we have the diversity that we need? Does rain feed plants or recharge the groundwater? Does it run off, deep percolate, degrade water? Um, we now can put two inches of water on in nine minutes at the Coda Lakes Research Farm without runoff. We will walk people behind those irrigators after we've done that. It's a fun thing to watch to, when I try to get them to step into that field because their paradigm says I'm going to sink up to my knees. And it's just like walking on a carpet. And once you do that, I think we kind of have people, and especially irrigators. But that's how it is on the prairie. You can walk in the prairie anytime you want to after rain. You don't sink in. You don't have water standing on the surface. No runoff. We have the armor. We have the macropores. Keith Burns talked some about that highway. The macropores, the breathing. The soil needs to breathe when you take any kind of tillage tool like a vertical tillage machine. We'll cut our infiltrate one pass. We'll cut our infiltration in half. We've done it. Makes no sense. And increases our weeds. We have the earthworms there. We actually had a graduate student that worked on uh, planting earthworms <laughs> at one time. Uh, and everybody looked at it as kind of goofy. But if you don't have them, it helps at least speed the process of getting them. If you've ever been around irrigation, you know you get wheel tracks. And they're as deep as you do tillage. So if you don't do tillage, you don't get the wheel tracks. It's kind of a nice logical thing. So there's 20 years of wheel track. And when the, when the guys from the first Dakota Lakes boards came to visit us at Redfield, they were all irrigators, they were all conventional tillers. And the thing that they noticed the most was the wheel tracks. When I get a group of irrigators from California, for instance, first thing they notice, first thing we show them is how deep our wheel tracks aren't. Because that gets them. Take the E out of ET. In irrigation, we use the term evapotranspiration. Evaporation is water that <coughs> goes away that doesn't do you any good. Transpiration is water that goes through a plant. Somebody asked the question earlier today, how do I get more of this or that in my soil? Increase the amount of water that goes through your plants. Increase the amount of plant growth, make the water grow through the plants. Don't allow the, the water to evaporate. Maximize, make, uh, make the water enter the soil with those macropores and maximize the water holding capacity of the soil. When we've decreased our organic matter by the levels we have, and Keith talked about it today, uh, Alan Williams talked about it today, we, we really change our water holding capacity in the soil, and that means, that means that we get waterlogged more and we get dry more, because the bucket is smaller. Make the bucket bigger. Now, this is good for irrigation, it's great for the dry land guys, so the impact of Dakota Lakes on the irrigators is that most of them quit irrigating. Dan Forge talks about his dryland corn yields. He has awfully good irrigated corn yields, and he has very low left, so he still irrigates. But anybody with over 200 foot or 250 foot of left has kind of quit. <clears throat> Ecosystems harvest sunlight. Okay, and that gives us energy. And Keith talked about that today. 
If we remove products from that ecosystem, then our bugs don't have the energy. So when you take hay off and haul it into the buildings, you've robbed the ecosystems of energy. <clears throat> Guys in North Dakota that do hay yet and have hay land, they have started to hay and leave the bales on the land they harvested them on and bring the cows to the hay land and feed the cows on the hay land so they're cycling the nutrients and the energy right there on that hay land and they've actually increased by a bale or two the production of the hay land. Okay? I used to have friends that come from Argentina where they did everything with their cattle in terms of grass fat cattle. And they'd see all the balers in South Dakota and they go, so Duane, the cows in Dakota have no legs. So when I see somebody hauling hay or something, I say, well, so your cows don't have any legs. And we went, went, went into an operation in France where they had the cows all in the building. And I'm saying to Sarah Singla, one of the Nuffeld scholars from France, I said, Sarah, the cows have legs. And she, she's telling me to shut up because they understand English. <laughs> they, they, they don't speak of <laughs> Is the energy used constant or finite? Finite. Is it benign? or potentially harmful. Well, the sunlight that you can harvest is free. It's constant. It's going to come up tomorrow, right? It's benign other than for us light-skinned Caucasians that don't wear proper, proper protection. And we can get some cancer, but other than that, it's, it's benign and it's internal. If you look at fossil fuels, you have to buy them, it's external and they're potentially damaging. Are the nutrients available for plant growth? See, and you ask yourself these questions. And, it, and, and, and when you're starting to do a tillage system, you can't answer these well. Are the nutrients available for plant use in environmental services or have they been leached, eroded, transported from the landscape, sent to China or to the ocean? Ecosystems that leak nutrients, and one of those would be carbon, turn into deserts. Desertification is loss of nutrients. And what we do all the time is we look at these ecosystems like Israel and whatever that were once gardens of Eden, and all of a sudden they're deserts. Man is very good at that. A 120-car train of soybeans contains 400,000 pounds of phosphate. Everybody loves these big unit loaders. You can load a unit train and the way it goes. It takes 400,000 pounds of phosphate with it. And they're not going to send it back. Saline seeps are when we don't have the water nutrient cycle working and the water exceeds the water holding capacity of the soil, takes the nutrients that are in the soil, and takes them down in the saline seat. SDSU in Watertown, Jim Clendenin's here someplace, he'll tell you this is a true story. When they bring students to my farm, I'll ask them, what's in a saline seat? And if they say salts, they get in trouble. Not the kids, the instructor. Because what's in a saline seat is fertilizer. Number one thing is nitrates, and then you got calcium sulfate, which is gypsum, and calcium carbonate, which is lime. What you're doing is losing your nutrients. We use cover crops to help us better balance the water nutrient cycle. And the question came up last night about what happened to the corn that was grown where there wasn't cover crop out yield of the corn where there was. Most likely that was a nitrogen problem because the nitrogen got sequestered into the cover crop. And I don't think they took account of that. Where the nitrogen is when you're doing a cover crop is the nitrogen is sequestered into the organic material which is exactly where you want it. If you're going to build organic matter you have to have both nitrogen and carbon. You just made some organic matter. When you till ground you decay the organic matter and produce nitrogen for your crop and that's what my grandfather came to South Dakota to do was to till the prairie to take the nitrogen out and he didn't really know or care about the organic matter at that time. We often do different mixes of things. We try to do 
a mix of perennials and annuals. There's some alfalfa growing between rows of corn. One of the little tricks we do to have a deep-rooted guy with a legume in there. We'll do uh, about four years or five years of alfalfa in, in, in those rows like that, plant the corn between, then we'll move the alfalfa row. Okay, so we got 20 inch rows, so we have one row of alfalfa every 60 and two rows of, of, of corn every 60 inches, so we're basically the same as a 30 inch row corn guy. Why do we want to do that? Well, the root systems of corn and beans and whatever are about this deep, and they're only this deep for about a month. Most of these, they're like this. We're not cycling the nutrients like those tall grass and mixed grass prairie did. We have one of these deep water things for um, a, a frost-free drinker that doesn't need electricity. It has to be buried seven feet. And I buried one in a switchgrass pasture a couple years ago, switchgrass area, and at seven feet I still had roots going down. Okay? Corn and beans, not even close. So I don't think we're going to get by without using some perennials. But maybe we're going to do it like Colin Sice does, where he grows switchgrass in the summertime and he grows his other crops in the wintertime, grazes the switchgrass in his summer. I don't know. I don't know how you're going to do it, but we have to do that. We don't have a choice. We've done some things with coated seed and flying things on and all kinds of different stuff with cover crops. And the idea is to try to match that water and nutrient cycle. Jeremy, Jeremy Wilson, a friend of mine from North Dakota that's a no-tiller, came up with this explanation of cover crops. It's catch and release nutrients. And I just went up after he did his talk and said, Jer Jeremy, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Take the South Dakota rights to that. Because that's what you're doing. You're putting them in a form they're not going to get in the water, they're not going to get in the drain tile. Our fertilizer program is fairly simple. Some start or pee with the seed, other nutrients are placed near the row at seeding time. The most important thing to do with corn is put some nitrogen near the seed at seeding time. And we can put it on the surface in strips after crop canopy, and we do that at times with wheat. Broadcasting fertilizer before or at seeding encourages weeds. <coughs> You need to know your available nutrient, your moisture, and your roots. Keith was talking to you about this big, huge root system. And so was Dr. Williams, these mycorrhizae root systems, huge root system. If I have a huge root system, I can have less available pea. And soil pea tests, Olson, Bray, Malik, any of those you use, are really a measure of solubility, not how much. Okay, and Keith mentioned that too. And so we can ha run very low levels of available pea and still get enough into our plant if we have the mycorrhizae. <clears throat> the way you kill them is you do tillage. It's very simple. If you do tillage, you don't have them. Weeds and diseases are Mother Nature's way of adding diversity to a system that lacks diversity. Another way of saying that is Mother Nature is an opportunist. If you have a problem, you have provided the opportunity somewhere in your system. So when you have a problem, don't try to figure out how to kill it or get rid of it. Figure out where you let it into the system. What we do now with weeds, for instance, in the corn <coughs> soybean area. Get a new weed and we just look for a different herbicide or a different technique to to whack it, and then you whack it, and then it, not, something else pops up. And I call that whack-a-mole farming. My, when my kids were little, they used to have this game where you had to whack these moles. And they keep thinking, if I just whack one more mole, it would be gone. Until you put diversity in the system, you're not going to have that. Does the action address the weakest point in the life cycle of the weed, or the insect, or whatever? We spray our weeds after they're up. That's not the most vulnerable time. It's already established. Getting a plant to start growing, I mean, it, once it's up and growing, your crop is up and growing, you feel really good about it. The weeds feel pretty good about themselves. They're the hardest to kill at that point in time. The best thing to do is not allow them to have seeds, not allow them to be in the field. 
not allow them to get a good start. This photo was taken in the early 1990s. It's a pursuit resistant kosher growing in some, some chickpeas. And it resulted because cyanamid had come up with what they called at that time emmy corn or pursuit tolerant corn. And I had a young grower say, well, I can do corn soybeans now. I don't have to worry about weeds. I can use pursuit in my corn and pursuit in my beans and I'll never have a weed again. And I said, well, you'll have weeds and you'll have resistant weeds and they'll be re resistant to other ALS herbicides and whatever. And I got a letter from Cyanamid wishing to have a retraction. And John wasn't here yet, he wasn't in on this. The dean and the director both got letters too, wanting a retraction. And the director, Ray Moore at the time, gave me a call and said, I think I know the answer, but is there any chance you'll retract? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'll handle it. And I called this Cyanamid guy and said, if I don't have resistant kochia at Dakota Lakes in three years, I'll retract. And then all I did is had Leon Reggie put a plot out, and I went and got my, neighbor, my neighbor's glean resistant kochia and grabbed one of them and shook it over top the plot. <laughs> Pretty easy. And I called this cyanamid guy. He said, I'm busy. I got all kinds of complaints to go take care of. Nature's efforts, efforts to add diversity can be countered by adding diversity of your own. And that's really the best way to handle the problem. We've had no need to apply broadcast insecticide to Dakota Lakes in 16 years. I never thought that that would happen, but we have lots of predators. Number one thing that kills aphids is fungus. Number two things that kill aphids is ladybugs. Then you got the minute pirate bugs and all these other guys, I love minute pirate bugs. Don't really like the bug that much, but I love the name, right? Little pirate bug, you know, where you imagine the little, little one patch over his eye or something, I don't know. But now imagine you, you, you know that and somebody says, we're going to put some herbicide on your beans or weed and, and let's just throw a little fungicide and insecticide in with the herbicide because it surely can't cost very much. Well, it might because you're killing all your predators. Ralph Holdsworth, like I, the, one of the guys I mentioned before, he always, when guys would say to him, he said, I want to be a no-tiller, he said, the first thing you need to do is to go down to Dakota Lakes and get your brain transplant. <laughs> to learn to think of things differently. No-till is not about lack of tillage, but about managing the soil, the water, uh, soil structure, soil biology, carbon compounds in the soil, the thing that everybody's been talking about today. It has nothing to do with quit and tillage, other than you can't do it if you do tillage, because you can't man you got everything all screwed up. Strive to produce a crop which is healthy, not a crop that does not get sick. And if I look around this room, I don't see anybody here that's sick. But if we hopped on bicycles and went for a 40 mile ride, there's difference in health amongst us. And the ones, the crops that are going to do the best when things get tough, get too dry, too hot, too cold, are the ones that are healthy. It means that you have to look at all these things around this wheel. And you can't just look at any one thing. Because if all you do is take tillage out and don't change anything else, and that's what's happened in the Corn Belt. Still want to do corn beans, which is not a rotation. It's a two-crop monoculture. And it's a two-crop monoculture that doesn't have enough carbon. Think of the native prairie with 80 or 90, I mean 90 or 98 percent grasses with big roots and lots of carbon. And you put that winky little soybean in there. So I think about <clears throat> that whole circle in terms of cultural practices, technology, and management. You can't replace, you can't replace what you did with tillage, that cultural practices with technology. Because if you try to do that, there's not enough technology available. Resistant weeds. Even if it was available, you probably can't afford it. Look at the price you're paying for GMO seed and the chemicals that go on it. You probably can't afford it. And if you could afford it, and it were available, you gotta sell it to the consumer. 
And frankly, they don't want it. Whether that's right or wrong, they don't want it. <laughs> so they don't want it. Okay, let's do something else. Let's figure out a way not to use it or at least to be able to defend why we're doing it and to understand it ourselves. So let's look at tillage, rotation, sanitation, competition. That's the cultural practices. If you take tillage out, because in nature, tillage is a catastrophic event. Remember, we set out to mimic what Mother Nature was doing. Mother Nature doesn't do tillage, unless it's a volcano or a landslide or a flood or something silly like that, a tsunami, okay? <clears throat> tillage is to agriculture what fracking is to petroleum. Both increase the speed and extent of removal of compounds from the ecosystem and leave the ecosystem or the system exhausted. That's what you want to do when you mine. That's what my ancestors did. They were miners. Okay? We can't do that anymore. If you could know only one thing about a soil, what parameter would you want to know? Talked about that earlier today, organic matter. And Keith gave these numbers within all textual classes, one to three percent, you double the water holding capacity. It's all about holding more water. If your soil only holds four or five inches of water, you're not very resilient. If it holds 10 or 12 or 14, and that's what we've done. Short-term studies are not accurate in evaluating things like crop rotations and tillage systems and that kind of stuff. We've never run a, a, a rotation study that went less than 10 years. But you can't get grants to do that. And we have a real structural problem in our experiment stations right now because the funding is all short term. Whereas in old days we used to have formula funds. That's on the federal government side. So Dakota Lakes allows us to do that. Crop rotation allows time for natural enemies to destroy pathogens of one crop while another crop is, is growing. Proper intensity, use the water you save by no-tilling, you're gonna save water, but you gotta use it. If you don't use it, it's gonna cause you problems. Adequate diversity, you don't need to have, like Dan Forge, 14 different crops <laughs> or something. You know, we do, because it says research on the gate. My guys say, why are we doing all these things? I said, it says research on the sign out there. So we have to do these. But if you're a real farmer, you don't have to do those. And, and then you'll get stable and, and, and stability out of the thing. Native vegetation, the best indicator of the range of intensities which are appropriate for location. Whenever I travel, the first thing I do is look at the native vegetation. That tells you what you can do. And then, from then on, it's easy. Because the native vegetation has already integrated the climate and the soils and those kind of things. It's already integrated all those together and it tells you this is what you can do here, okay? Most of the plant growth problems blamed on no-till are the result of inadequate diversity or improper intensity. We just haven't gotten that mix right. We're trying to do what we want to do other than not what Mother Nature wants us to do. You gotta put that water you save by no-till to work. You need to use more high water use crops. And then if that doesn't do it, you use cover crops and double crops and those kind of things. At least three crop types, long intervals of two to four years are needed to break some of the cycles. And we've got lots of stuff you, you received a copy or should have of uh, managing agri agriculture ecosystem should be in your thing and, and it, it explains a lot of that stuff. But you should have a situation like this where if you did what I did there where I ought to, you know, had my auto steer, ought to steer better than that, and, and, and you leave, leave a gap, but there's no weeds there. And that wasn't apparent to me either until people would come and visit and they'd walk out and they'd find a gap in the field and there wouldn't be any weeds and they're going, why isn't there weeds in your gap, in your skip? because we have lots of diversity and we control the weed seeds, okay? Organic matter makes a difference. Here's a wheat field in 2006. The year before that wheat was peas, the year before the peas was corn. 
in that field. Doesn't look very good, it's a dry year. But if I turn around and look to the other side of the road, there's a wheat field that the year before was peas and the year before that was corn as well. They were both the same for two years before we planted the wheat. What's the difference? Well, for 10 years we had done two different rotations. One was corn pea winter wheat. That's the one that looks good, nice and red in an infrared photo. And the other one was soybean corn pea winter wheat. Every other year broadleaf, there's not enough carbon in that system. You can't add organic matter without adding the carbon. Co crops like soybeans and peas don't have very much carbon. You just don't have the right carbon and nitrogen ratios. Okay? So I call that my Canadian, where they do wheat, canola, wheat, pea, or my corn belt, corn, soybean, corn, soybean rotation. Those are the same kinds of rotations. So, does that happen every year? Well, in 2006, 60 bushel versus 29, when we had 7.9 inches of rain between the time we harvested the peas and we harvested the wheat. In 2005, when we had 23 inches in that year, 92 versus 57, and if we look at 2002, 56 versus 28. But we didn't see that for the first 10 years. You could see the soils weren't as good, but you didn't see the yield differences. <clears throat> we still see that difference. Here's some stuff from 2016. The good rotations are like 95 and those kind of numbers, and the other ones are dropping down into 60 and such. Okay. How about under high rainfall conditions? We have irrigation. The same thing happens with irrigation. Corn, soybean, we average about 63 bushel an acre up until, you know, this is until 2013. If we did a corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, more diverse rotation, the first year soybeans, 76 bushel, the second rotation in the, in the system after the wheat cover crop swing, 82, 81.2. So if I look at those two, we got 62.9 and an average of 78 on the other one. If I had a real farm of 5,000 acres, let's think about that. And I got corn in there, I got, if I do continuous corn, I get about 200. If I do corn soybean, I got 217. And if I do that corn corn thing, the first one's like 240 or 50 uh, or a little better, two, 237 something average between those two corns. So the corn's doing better as well with more diversity. And if I had 5,000 acres, I got over a million, if I'm doing all corn on corn, I got over a million bushels of corn, but I have a big dryer <laughs> and lots of semis. If I do 2,500 acres of each, then I got less, you know, half of, just under half a million bushels of corn and, and I get, um, 157,000 some odd bushels of beans. If I do corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, I get more bushels of soybeans on 2,000 acres than I did on 2,500 acres of corn, soybean. I get less corn, but I get 120,000 bushels of wheat. So do you think it makes sense to, to trade 72,500 bushels of corn for 120,000 bushels of wheat and 350 bushels of soybeans? But all the time in the Corn Belt, I have guys go, oh, I can't do anything but corn beans. I can't afford to grow that wheat. You can't afford not to grow the wheat. Because you have time to do cover crops and time to get rid of resistant weeds and get rid of cyst nematodes and all those things, that whack-a-mole stuff you've been doing, you don't have to do that anymore. As citizens of the U.S. and the world, you need to decide what you would like agriculture to look like in the future. The Coal Lakes Research Farm looks two and 600 years in advance. We try to have that exercise once a year where we sit down and think about, if we keep doing what we're doing, what the heck is it gonna look like? Do we want our communities to totally go away? Nobody looks at that stuff anymore. The university should be looking that far in advance in some of the research. Governments aren't going to. Corporations aren't going to, because they have short-term goals. 
Native American culture-based decisions on their potential impact for the next seven generations, that's 280 years, at 40 years per generation. Dan pulled this one out, I still use it. Never in history has all of mankind not only faced this type of impending catastrophe with a change in soil and the pressure on food and the change in the climate. Research needs to be transformational, not transitional or incremental. 80% of the total input costs in agriculture right now, uh, non-land costs, variable costs, can be traced directly to energy. Average <clears throat> price of wheat in 1970 was $1.37 a bushel. Average price of a barrel of oil was $3.39. What's that today? We're taking something that's going up in price to produce something that's going down in relative price. Doesn't make any sense, okay? We're getting better at it, right? Takes energy, one gallon diesel fuel to manufacture, transport, and apply five pounds a N, and Keith referred to this issue. 150 pounds a N is equivalent to 30 gallons of diesel fuel. There's probably very few people in eastern South Dakota and Minnesota that use less than 150 pounds of N per acre. Just think of going out there and throwing 30 gallons of diesel fuel on every acre. Fossil fuel input in agriculture 120 years ago was essentially zero. In 120 years and probably less, it'll have to be zero again. Have we started to think about that? Somebody, somebody really needs to think about it. We don't change our eating habits until we've had our first heart attack. Right? Maybe we should start before then. The Coal Lakes Research Farm will be fossil fuel neutral by 2026. We cold press our oil seeds, flax, canola, soybeans, but especially flax, and we use the meal for our cows, and the flax oil we can sell. And sunflower is another one. We should be addressing the problem instead of treating the symptom. I hate to be hard on NRCS, but they spend a lot of years building terraces, which are treating a symptom, and waterways. People always ask me if I know Gabe Brown, and I always tell them, well, I know both Gabe Brown and Jay Fuhrer, and Gabe Brown was a conventional tiller when I met him, and Jay Fuhrer brought him down, and Gabe, uh, Jay had just won this award for building the most terraces and waterways in North Dakota, and I ruined their whole day, okay? But they've now become famous, so. That's what terraces do, they don't treat the problem. I've learned more from observing nature than trying to change it, Mother Nature has been managing ecosystems better and for longer than anyone else. She harvests a maximum amount of sunlight. She leaks very few nutrients, including carbon, which is a nutrient, from the system. She recycles things. She makes maximum use of water and nutrients by having webs of mycorrhizal fungi and other tricks. She uses animals, big ones and little ones as part of the system. In dry or brittle environments, this is Alan Savory's statement, <clears throat> soil biology slows during times of low soil moisture. And that's why he thinks you need to have the animals. I think it has to do with the rumen of the grazing animal remains moist during those periods of dryness, uh, continuing biological processes. And in <clears throat> cold climates, I think we have one of those here. Soil biology slows during periods of low soil temperature. The rumen of the animal remains warm, continuing soil biology. So we think the animals are part, part of the reason they're important is they continue, they bridge uh, us through the cold and whatever. So we're using our cover crops, uh, especially on our more humid areas, our, rain, our, our irrigated areas, we grow cover crops of oats and barley and peas and whatever, that's what you see here. We swath them. And then we will leave that swath in place into the winter. That, that crop was grown after we harvested a wheat crop. So that rotation I showed you where we had wheat in there, we also had that cover crop. So we get this nice forage crop, it stays nice and green. Cows are finding it fine today under the snow, that's not a problem. Uh, it stays nice and green under there and they can find it if it's in a swath. If it's just standing there, it gets snowed under. There's some really good work in Alberta and in Nebraska. I think the dean might know something about some of this stuff. He's from Nebraska. He probably reads their NEB guides and things. 
And then we use our, we move fence every day uh, to make that easier whenever we can. We put them on the irrigators and move the irrigators. It's easier to move the irrigators and pull, pull posts out and move them. Uh, Gabe Brown told me one time, he said, I don't want to move in fence. He said, I like moving fence. He's welcome to come do that for me today if he wants to. Uh, but I think Gabe goes to meetings and his kid moves the fence. So I think that <laughs> Anyway, we move it like that. The nice thing, if we're moving them every day and really keeping track of them, they spread the residue back out. Uh, we've thought through that quite a bit. Where do you get wind protection? Well, we don't need our big tur trailers for people in the winter. There's not a big bunch of people who want a tur today. So we built these little wings on them, and that's our calf shelter because we're fall calving. Uh, and so we got babies out there, you know, not real babies. They were born in, in uh, uh, August and September. But look at the quality of that stuff. 18.2%. We'll get three and a half to four tons of dry matter. RFE of 121. And then we, they have access to that and then also access to corn stalks. So that's how we balance their diet. Uh, how are we going to feed 12 billion people, 9 billion, all these numbers I hear? Well, we're not going to send food to them because they can't afford it. When I went to Ghana a few years ago, after we went to France, I went to Ghana and warmed up. Uh, <laughs> quite a shock to go from France in the wintertime to Ghana, it's just, but it was great. But they, can't, they make three bucks a day. They can't afford our food. And they can do a perfectly good job, good job of feeding their own, uh, growing their own if we help them do that, get the heck out of the road. How are we going to take this marginal land and turn it into human edible food? High-level high protein, we've got to use ruminant animals. We're not going to do it all organic vegetables. We're going to have to use animals on these fragile soils. 40 million more cows, more goats, and more sheep. The number one meat eaten in the world is goat. The world's supply of mineable phosphorus will be exhausted in less than 120 years. Use of perennial sequences or perennial cover crops will probably be necessary. What Mother Nature does not do, she does not do tillage unless it's a catastrophic event. And she does not export nutrients. Now we used to export a few nutrients down the rivers and the salmon brought them back. Or the sturgeon. And the bear ate the salmon and the nutrients were cycled. And we put in dams so the, so the salmon can't get there anymore. Oh, we're so smart. Okay? Commonality amongst tillage tools. All tillage tools destroy soil structure. I wrote this because somebody had given a 45-minute talk on different kinds of tillage tools. And I was going to be the next speaker, so I made this slide up. And I was looking at it, and somebody snuck up behind me and say, well, what are you doing with that? And they said, I'm trying to figure out if I'm enough of a budhead to actually show this. <laughs> and that person closed their computer and walked out of the building, so it made it easy. All tillage tools destroy soil structure. All tillage tools de decrease water infiltration. All tillage tools decrease organic matter. And all tillage tools increase weeds. We got data for every one of those. Bureaucracies, governments, and corporations are operated by people with limited tenure or short-term goals. That includes the university. John is not going to make his living being here. He's going to go somewhere else, or he's going to move up, or whatever. That's the way our system works. There are very few of us college professors that last a whole career in one spot. And you have to be mentally challenged to do that. <laughs> Society. Landowners and farmers deserve to have long-term research. So we're going to have to, we as farmers have to run it. The climate will change in the next 600 years, but by studying Lewis and Clark, yeah, the climate's changed. But we've had much more impact on the ecosystem with man's activity on the land than the impact by what's happened to the climate. Degradation of the ecosystem will have more potential impact. Farmers and ranchers harvest sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water and produce products we can sell. Some of this is human food. We need to be aware of nutrition issues and offsite impacts. I got a call from Cargill, the 
director of sustainability and whatever the other day. They want to source food that they can sell as a consumer as being name a name, regenerative, sustainable, healthy, whoopee, whatever, right? And the new one, Patagonia, how many people know what Patagonia is, the company? Yeah, the girls all know. They go, oh, Patagonia, yeah. They want organic regenerative, okay? In France, I kept getting the question, can you do organic no-till? And it's hard to answer that question through an interpreter. So after the first day, because I've thought about this, after the first day I, I said, yeah, I think we can, but it's going to take seven species of animals. And they were fine with that. They went, okay, you know, and let me go ahead. So I get back to the United States, and Gabe Brown comes to this meeting I'm at, or he and I are both speaking. He comes in the speaker's lounge. He goes, did you say this? I said, yeah, I said that. He said, what animals? I said, it depends on what your problem is. And he said, I got Canada thistle. I said, well, it takes goats or horses. He closed his notebook and says, I don't want any goats or horses on my farm. <laughs> but the funniest part of that is Ruth. You know, she would come to some of the meetings and some of them not, right? When she's in France, she had better things she could do than listen to the same talk in French over and over again. And <clears throat> we got back and I was telling somebody about this and I said, this came up with this number seven, they were good with that. And she says, don't, don't you know what it is? I say, I have no idea. We've got to do the research. But I think it's seven might be it. You know, it's, I don't know. <laughs> Peak oil is when half the oil's gone. We're past that. Peak phosphorus, we're past that. Peak soil, we're probably past that. Over half of it's gone. What the heck are we waiting for? Keith, last night, we were at the meeting, showed Iowa, we started this organic matter, you know, the soil was this deep, and then 20 years later it's this deep, and then 20 years later it's this deep, and they still got this much left after 100 some years. Why is, why is that even acceptable? We should throw them in jail or something. You know, we can't be doing that anymore. Take the E out of ET, take the T out of can't. Doing the right thing environmentally is almost always the correct economic approach in the long run. Thank you.